Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basik. And I'm Matt Miller. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And besides Matt Miller being back to us, we're also looking at institutional investors here, BlackRock, Hamilton Lane, and others back the first public blockchain tokenized fund with a new funding round. Securitized CEO Carlos Domingo joins us to discuss the fund. Plus, FTX has amassed billions of dollars more than it needs to cover what customers lost in its gigantic collapse, setting customers up to be paid in full, but they're still upset. We'll tell you why. And as U.S. election season heats up, the CFTC takes a major step toward directly banning derivatives from being used to bet on political contests. We're going to talk to a major player in this space. All right, thanks to an amazingly generous policy here at Bloomberg LP, I have been on paternity leave for the past six months. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at what Bitcoin's done over that time. And no surprise, it has absolutely soared. Up 72% uh, percent right now, $64,780 um, is where we're trading right now. Doing very well today as well, as are a lot of crypto assets as the market rallies, even as we see meme stocks uh, come down from the amazing gains they've had the last couple of days. You can see Ether's up uh, 3% right now. Coinbase is trading up 4.5%. MicroStrategy up 7.25% right now. And iShares Bitcoin Trust, IBT, also putting up some big gains on the day. Shanali? We were talking about that pricing exuberance while you have been gone. And if you take a look at trading volumes, it was in synchrony with the prices of Bitcoin, of course. We see now those trading volumes starting to normalize. Remember, they had hopped toward that $3 trillion mark, Matt, for a while there. But you are seeing that normalization. They are still elevated, these volumes. And that is still after we saw that initial exuberance from the halving and the introduction of those spot Bitcoin ETFs. But it's yet to see what will cause another leg higher. I say halving. <laughs> halvening. The halvening. Something like that. I get a lot of flack for that. But there's an L, right? Okay. Trading volume is skyrocketing for one particular uh, coin as well, which is really interesting. And that is one that's linked to GameStop, at least in terms of name, uh, symbol, um, uh, logo. Although there's no official link between this token, GME crypto uh, token, and the company GameStop, it has absolutely soared ever since the meme stock has taken off, going from nearly zero to almost two cents which is a lot, Chanali. It sure is, and we're going to discuss it with Bloomberg's Emily Nicole, who reported on this. Emily, describe exactly what we saw happen this week. So just as you'd expect to see in the actual GameStop shares and in the shares of other meme stocks like AMC, we saw a similar rally happen in meme coins that are named the same but aren't actually affiliated with the actual projects or, co or companies um, and in that case I mean if you were looking at like the GME token that you guys just had on screen even if you'd bought uh, right before the token jumped when you know that tweet came out on Monday morning and then to now it's definitely come off the highs the same way as the stocks themselves have but you'd still be up about 2,800 percent which is a pretty tidy return compared to probably what people are getting in the shares. Yeah and it still seems to be worth far more than it should be. I mean, there's no intrinsic value. I suppose you could say that about a heck of a lot of the assets that we cover. Um, is GameStop not angry about this? I mean, if somebody started a Matt Miller coin and used my logo, I'd be pretty unhappy about it. Oh, I bet. I mean, it's, we haven't asked GameStop to find out, but it's pretty typical in crypto. Anybody can make one of these coins in a matter of minutes. And, and you know, finding out who's responsible for them is pretty difficult as well. Crypto, as we know, is a pretty anonymous environment. Um, and so finding out who even made these coins is pretty difficult to do. Uh, the coin itself is still out there. You can still buy it. But, you know, you're not seeing it on any of the main exchanges where you might actually be able to find out who's behind the projects. You're not going to see it on, on Coinbase or any of those big ones. It's all going to be in the, the tidy world of centralized finance. To your point here, too, what trust is there when you don't know who's behind it? Of course, we know that when it came to buying the initial GameStop stock, it was behind the real return here of Roaring Kitty. Why did we see uh, the crypto version get as much love? Do you think it continues at this point? 
crypto investors love to speculate. It's kind of the entire point of crypto is speculation. And so the fact that something doesn't have intrinsic value, it doesn't have a known person behind it or a known company. I mean, that's nothing. It's pretty much the way you have to interact with the whole industry. And so in this particular case, the, the coin that we we're talking about here, GME, it was made back in early January. Um, and so it's been around for a couple of months. It's something that you probably, you know, as meme coins gain popularity again, somebody thought, oh, here's a bright idea. I'll make one that's linked to a meme stock in case that comes back again. And look, that's what exactly it did. In terms of those buying the coin, I mean, yeah, they have they have no recourse here. It could the project founder could easily take all of the money out of the project and, and just run away with it in what's known as a rug pull, and, and you'd be left with nothing. And um, but that's that's the fun of it, almost, right? I mean, you could have these massive returns and potentially make some money if you sell at the right time. It's also a matter of whether there's liquidity in the market to even buy what you want to sell. It. It's totally you know a free for all. Massive returns and or rug pull. <laughs> Uh, that is the fun of it. Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Emily Nicole covers crypto uh, for us out of London. Let's get to the meme trade uh, or, or, or to really away from the meme trade and to um, real market institutional news. Securitize has secured $47 million in funding led by BlackRock, helping BlackRock's push into private market tokenization. It's become the largest tokenized treasury fund in less than two months since its launch. Um, we'll discuss with Securitize CEO Carlos Domingo. And first off, Carlos, set, us, uh, set up your, your company for us because you've actually uh, received over $100 million more funding than that. Um, how does it look right now? Well, we've been in the, doing this uh, tokenization since uh, 2018, uh, and it's been a very long journey to get the technology right, to get the, the licenses and the regulatory licenses with the SEC, et cetera, to be able to operate. As you said, we've been raising quite a lot of money, but I think this uh, particular uh, project that we're doing with BlackRock as well as the fundraise is very significant because it, it, the, the, it's going to be the largest tokenized fund in history, also the fastest growing, as you said, in less than two months became the largest one, and also the fact that this issue by the largest uh, asset manager that has also become a shareholder and, and a board member of the company is a very important step in our journey. How is the demand looking for the fund right now? How quickly is it growing and how do you see future demand looking? Well, we just started. <laughs> so uh, I think this is going to get a lot bigger than it is. Uh, and as we spread the word about what the fund is and we talk to more people, and we own more and more people in the more institutions in the company, et cetera, I think you're going to see this accelerating uh, over time. I think what we've done already is very remarkable, but I think we're just scratching the surface. So uh, the, the, I love the ticker, which is Biddle, right? B-U-I-D-L. <laughs> That's it, correct. It's fun because it plays on HODL, um, but this is serious, a serious fund, right? Um, what kind of interest are you seeing? You know, who's buying it and what are they using using it for? So I think it's great, by the way, that, that uh, BlackRock went with the ticker because, as you say, it's a play on HODL that crypto people use. So, so the fact that they're, they're using it as a ticker is great for the crypto community. We're seeing adoption in three different directions. One is just basically on-chain treasury management for companies like, you know, DAOs, foundations, etc. The second one is building derivative products that a lot of people have been claiming that they tokenize treasuries or tokenize money market funds without having on-chain access to the underlying, and now they have one. And then the third one is to be able to use it as collateral for, for trading, because people, for the most part, they post stable coins, so now they can put, you know, post something that earns a yield and that improves the, their performance. So those are kind of like the three mm -hmm. different directions we're going with this. Carlos, what are the regulatory implications here, too? I know that the money parts of the fund part, the regulatory part is not as fun to talk about. But if you have an SEC and a CFTC to some degree that have been somewhat critical of certain products that have been in the token space, then why is it so easily allowed at this point for people to be building tokenized assets off of traditional financial services when the uh, crypto universe tokenization is still under scrutiny? Well, this is a security. There's no dispute about it, right? So I think that the, the issue that crypto people have is whether the tokens they're issuing are securities or, or commodities. We obviously assume and admit that this is a security. It's issued by a transfer agent that we own, which is a regulated, uh, it's a registered transfer agent with the SEC. It's sold through a broker dealer. Uh, it's also SEC regulated. So I don't think that there is any you know, controversy around what we do from a regulatory perspective is clearly a security and it's clearly regulated by SEC and we follow all the, all the rules of, uh, you know, how private securities are being issued and sold. 
Carlos, uh, just before the show, Shanali was explaining to me um, the efficiencies of tokenization. In her example, she used her phone as an asset. <laughs> I think a money market fund um, is a much better asset to use. What are other assets that you think are ripe for tokenization? Where does it provide the best efficiencies? So I think that ultimately you can think of any security to be more efficient when it's tokenized, right? Uh, because tokenization brings you, you know, a, a better ledger where you track the securities. It gives you, uh, you know, the securities and the cash to be able to trade, uh, you know, on the same ledger without having counterparty risks and all the issues you have in traditional capital markets. So I don't think that there is one security that is better than another. I just think that depending on market conditions, some securities are more attractive uh, to be tokenized than others. And today, as you well, know, we are in a high interest rate environment. So obviously money market funds, private credit, things like that are more interesting. So let me put it this way then. Um, when you're sitting in, in a boardroom or doing a whiteboard, right, with people from BlackRock or other institutional investors, what are the products that you're talking about tokenizing next? I think after, uh, you know, the success we've had with uh, money market funds and treasuries, I think private credit, uh, which we already have a, a product with, with Hamilton Lane, is probably kind of like the, the next wave that is going to come. It's also the second largest category of tokenized real world assets in, in crypto already. And I think that we can actually bring more institutional grade products uh, to market, mm -hmm. like the one we already have, as I mentioned, with Hamilton Lane, but others from you know, BlackRock or, or KKR or other of our partners uh, into the crypto ecosystem that today they do not really exist. Who are the biggest buyers in these tokenized funds? Because if you're talking about the tokenization of private credit, you're talking about an illiquid asset generally that could be put into more retail hands through the vein of tokenization. There's a huge argument argument, Carlos, about how ready that market is for that. How quickly could tokenization really facilitate the move into retail hands? Well, first, private credit is not necessarily liquid, right? So I think it's, it's semi-liquid, uh, like the one we have uh, has monthly liquidity. So it's not like private equity or, or VC that are very liquid and it's hard to make them more liquid. Um, I think that, look, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not fair if you want that that uh, you know, retail customers do not have access to the same type of products that institutional people have. And if you look at the portfolio allocation of an institutional uh, you know, investor, they do have a, percent, a percentage of their assets in alternative assets where private credit is, is one of them, right? So I think that you know, trying to democratize access to, to alternative assets through tokenization is something that is going to bring value to, to in retail investors. And you know, like many other products, like ETFs or other products that retail people didn't touch before and now they're very popular with retail, I believe the asset class will become popular with retail as well. Carlos, we have to leave it there. That is Securitize CEO Carlos Domingo, of course, with the partnership there with BlackRock in a very new, a highly uh, publicized here, uh, tokenized fund. Now, coming up, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about event contracts under more regulatory scrutiny from the CFTC. We're going to discuss with the CEO of one of the leaders in the space, Kalshi. And FTX plans to repay customers back all of their money plus interest but those customers, at least some of them, are still mad about missing Bitcoin's record rally since bankruptcy. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. FTX customers who lost their money during the collapse of the exchange missed out on a rally that has quadrupled the price of Bitcoin, you may have noticed. Now they're getting paid back the money they lost, and they're even getting paid interest, but they're still mad because they missed out, obviously, on that massive gain they could have possibly had. Bloomberg's Jonathan Randall's reported on this, and he joins us now. And first of all, Jonathan, it's amazing that you know, the victims of this giant bankruptcy are getting paid back. I remember talking to a hedge fund manager who was buying distressed claims at like 20 cents on the dollar. And right. my only thought was, why would you even buy that? But now <laughs> he looks pretty smart. Uh, he looks very smart. There, there, you know, 
there are a lot of um, investors and even retail customers uh, who bought up claims um, pretty soon after FTX filed bankruptcy in November 2022. Um, it was trading around 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, you were saying 20 cents uh, on the dollar. And now uh, the expectation is that uh, most customers will get 118% back. So uh, above par, which is, which is pretty incredible. But even though it's above par, one thing that I'm not understanding is why it's based on November 2022 pricing. Why couldn't they do it more recently? Um, so what uh, the new CEO of FTX and the uh, advisors have said is that is really just a requirement of uh, the bankruptcy law and how Chapter 11 works. And we've seen similar pricing uh, done in the other crypto bankruptcies, not just FTX. But the, the, the theory behind it is you're locking in a price at the time of the bankruptcy. So it, yes, it, it's a problem if you have a volatile asset that goes up substantially in value, uh, which is what we've seen with Bitcoin and other you know, tokens since the bankruptcy. But it also protects, you know, this is bankruptcy. It's not just about crypto. It protects uh, downside. So if you had a claim when a company filed bankruptcy, it protects you uh, in case the value uh, of that claim deteriorates uh, since the bankruptcy. So, so really, why is this happening? It's a function of what bankruptcy and how bankruptcy works. And that has been a conflict with how crypto works. And we've seen that over and over again. This is just kind of the latest uh, iteration of it. I can understand with, you know, the price of Bitcoin going from 15 grand uh, at sort of the, the low point where um, where they want it, where the, the bankruptcy uh, uh, cre creditors want to want to market to 62,000, 64,000, 65,000. I get that that's recovered. What are the other assets that FTX has had or has that have made it possible to pay back um, the creditors? Well, they, they have a ton of Solana um, and that's had a similarly, you know, enormous uh, increase in price since uh, the bankruptcy started. They also had a large stake in Anthropic, the AI uh, startup, uh, and they've sold uh, a substantial amount of the, the shares they had in that. So th those are two big sources of recovery. They've also filed uh, a number of lawsuits to recover money uh, that FTX, while it was run by Sam Bankman Freed, was paying out to different um, you know, other companies, different nonprofit organizations. Um, and a lot of that litigation is outstanding. So it's a combination of litigation. Um, Anthropic is a big, you know, a big component, and and holdings in Solana, uh, another big component. But um, yeah, th those are the three kind of biggest. Mm -hmm. Bloomberg's Jonathan Randalls, thank you for your time and for your reporting. Catch out his uh, story here on Bloomberg.com and on a Bloomberg terminal. Now, coming up, Kyle Shee, CEO, joins us to discuss the CFTC's fight over event contracts. That's up next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Now, last week, the CFTC took a major step toward trying to directly ban derivatives from being used to bet on political contests and sports games. We're going to discuss this with the CEO of one of those firms, Kalshi, which just inked a deal with Susquehanna to open a trading desk for its event contracts. And CEO Tarek Mansour joins us now. What a crazy time to face this dispute with the CFTC right before an actual major election cycle. How are you responding and how quickly can you have this resolved? Yeah, well, first of all, Matt, uh, uh, thanks for having me. I think, um, you know, a little bit of context on how we got here. Uh, so Kalshi is the first and only legal prediction market in the U.S. Uh, the community of prediction market traders has been growing phenomenally, and the product is very simple. You predict the future, you make money. Uh, is it always yes or no? Is it binary? Right now it's yes or no. I think we're progressing into a variety of different products. Uh, but, you know, you can imagine who will win the elections, what's going to happen to the weather tomorrow, uh, will TikTok get banned? Uh, and, you know, the, the industry has been seeing explosive growth in the last year. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, you know, we're doing millions of transactions a day now. Uh, our community of traders is growing. We've seen people, crazy things like people making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on weather this month alone. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, 
uh, Susquehanna, Jeff, Jeff Yassa Susquehanna is now committed, the first dedicated institutional market maker to trading on these products. Um, they're on your board, right? They're not on our board. They're just committed to the asset class, first large institution to just set up a division that will trade prediction markets and events. Um, what differentiates us as a company, there's a number of other kind of unregulated offshore companies, is that we went the legal route. We spent three years and a half with the CFC to get regulated up front. We got approved by a bipartisan 5-0 vote, which is incredible. Um, and we've seen the kind of tremendous growth since then. Yep. Um, I mean, I've been following the company since Matt Levine wrote about you yes. guys back in 2021. And the question is, how will regulators deal with it? You've gotten along with regulators really well. Yeah. Um, but there are still issues like uh, in terms of an election, what's the dispute resolution mechanism? Um, how do you decide who's a winner? For example, you know, uh, former President Donald Trump may claim that he won the 2020 election. How do you deal with someone who agrees with them on that? Yeah, so I think that's a great question, Matt. I mean, I think, um, you, know, I'll, you know, like any financial, any new financial technology comes with risks and comes with difficulties, right? And so you're always going to have to weigh the, you know, benefits and the, and the costs. And so what are the benefits? And then I'll respond to that question. So the benefits are, are two things. Um, one, you let people risk manage against elections, which people, I used to work at Goldman. If you go to Goldman, you can do it. But this is not accessible to everybody. Um, and so this is an open market where everybody can access. And two, you get accurate election forecasts. I believe one of the most important products to be working on the next 10 years is bringing more truth into the system. And I think it's one of those uh, uh, election markets can bring a little bit more truth to that process. So we have uh, very little time left, but really curious about what you think a different administration would treat these contracts like. Do you think that even if this current administration comes down hard on this product, do you think a Trump administration would treat it differently? You know, there was a headline on Marginal Revolution that was like, there's no such, no, there's no good reason for such a ruling. Uh, so look, I'll let the politics alone. I, it's just not my job to weigh in. I think what I do know is that the, there's a lot of internal dissent within the commission. There's disagreement on what, what happened, and some are even calling this, uh, uh, you know, a blockage potentially illegal and, and against the First Amendment. But also we're seeing a Congress upheaval with a number of letters being sent by senators and representatives about this because you're setting a precedent of banning categories of legitimate economic activity, and this is the most important thing that people are talking about, you're potentially recreating the conditions for another FTX. You're pushing this activity from onshore regulated companies with customer protection to offshore illegal companies that can steal customer funds. All right, it's a fascinating uh, company, and we hope to have you back because you also uh, overlap with crypto. That's why we have you on the show. But I think um, prediction markets are fascinating on their own. So Tarek, thanks so much for joining us. Couchy CEO Tarek Mansour. That does it for Bloomberg Crypto. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.